Good morning. It is September 7, 2022, and this is uh, soon to be the opening of council time, but we begin first at 9 a.m. now with a, an important work session. This is on the National uh, Center for um, State uh, Counties uh, it, it, as far as the case flow, the calendaring, and operations study. Um, we'll be hearing from Clark County Superior Court, and uh, we look forward to um, what has been uh, found in this study. And I'm not sure if we turn it over to uh, the judge or to Amber or to whom. <gasps> you hit my mic. Chair, Judge Vanderwood and Judge Snyder are, are here. Can you hear me? Amber, you're on mute. All right, you're able to hear us, hopefully. Uh, barely. Um, if maybe you could get a little bit closer to your microphone. All right, we'll see what we can do. Is that loud enough for you? It's certainly loud that in is, here. That is better. How about for others? Yeah, I think we're okay, hopefully. Great. All right, so I am Judge Vanderwood, as you mentioned. I'm joined here uh, in our meeting room with Judge Snyder. Uh, we're the presiding and assistant presiding judges for Clark County Superior Court. We also have our court administrator, Cheryl Stone, who's participating virtually. Want to acknowledge her and all of her efforts that she continues to put forward on our behalf, including uh, this very important project for us in Clark County Superior Court. Uh, by way of just a little bit of background, this effort was put together through consultants from the National Center for State Courts who spent an extensive amount of time exploring our current processes and procedures, meeting with a variety of different participants within our superior court system. They are consultants who have extensive experience, not only professionally, one as a judge uh, for many years, another as a court administrator for many years, but also working as consultants for the National Center and have had experience in many jurisdictions, including in other locations in Washington, putting together analysis of the systems. Here they were looking at our overall calendaring system, the case flow, what we have in place to move forward. And, and although, as all of us know, change can be challenging, change can be uncomfortable, and having someone come in to look at your system to point out flaws, weaknesses, and challenges is also not always a comfortable process. But we were anxious to initiate that process. We're glad to be a part of it. And while this report is not our own work product, it's not something that we put together, we're certainly mindful of the important structure and framework that this suggest for us and are anxious for the opportunity to move forward with it. Certainly all of you will not be surprised that there have been a lot of changes in everything that we do as it relates to COVID in all of our different areas. Uh, the court system has many of those same changes and experiences that come up in the last couple of years. And some of the structural challenges that are present in Superior Court with our past systems were kind of highlighted, I guess, in a way through that COVID process. And they created new challenges that we adapted through and worked through. And I want to point out initially something that's very important to us, and that is that the process that's so important for courts to take into effect, even during the time of challenge and COVID and what's involved, that would not at all be possible without the committed staff members and great assistance that we have in Superior Court. The only way that we've been able to maintain a functioning working court system during all of the challenges over the last couple of years is because of their dedication and commitment being engaged and involved in court every day, in person, to interact with people that were involved. Other than the very short time period initially in COVID when we were required to stay home as a community, we have had our employees and staff 
and bench physically present in the courthouse to engage in that important work. So we're going to talk about some challenges today and hopefully a path forward with a structure that's going to be helpful in a lot of ways, especially hopefully to litigants, to members of our community. But we certainly want to highlight that the work and effort that has moved through so much over the last two years to keep us moving forward. Now, when we talk about more of the specifics that we're going to get into at this point, I do want to mention that the implementation date as a Superior Court bench we're moving towards is January 1st of 2023. So that doesn't mean all of the suggested changes are necessarily 100% going to be adopted by Superior Court. It doesn't mean that all of the suggested changes are going to be implemented by that January 1st date, but we're working to implement those that we think are appropriate, necessary, and reasonable to get those changes implemented. Because if we look at the next slide here on our PowerPoint, you can see uh, the overview initially that's identified in the report. These were the various areas that they highlighted and provided information about. And we'll talk about these varying degrees with specificity this morning. And then the next slide, if we take a look at it, kind of highlights some challenges with the current system that we have. That current system is one that we do feel can be improved, that this does provide a framework for that improvement. And you can see here some of the reasons why they've pointed out some deficiencies in the process that we have. To me, that Clark County rapid growth is a significant and important one. In many ways, the structures, the process, procedures that we implement and are utilizing in Superior Court are based on a structure where Clark County was much smaller, where there was much uh, less demand on the court system, fewer cases that were participating. As the county has grown, there have been some increases to the number of the bench and the number of judicial officers that we have. Uh, but even with that amount of judicial officers, based on the overall perspective of the Administrative Office of Courts, which kind of oversees the judicial system in Washington, we're still not fully up to the number of judicial officers in Clark County that they indicate we should have, but it has increased over time. And as it's increased over time, that system has not really been comprehensively changed or modified in any way. And so that's where this lack of planning comes into place. In some ways, the way I view it is we're working with a system that no longer was built on an actual plan format. It's one that has been added to as there's been changes, new judicial officers, but not a comprehensive look at what needs to be done. As a result, they highlight a fragmented system, uh, a system that's not always as efficient as it should be or needs to be, and a system that doesn't get cases to resolution as efficiently as would be ideal or we would like to have. That highlights a point that I'll mention and then turn some time over to Judge Snyder for the remaining slides. I mentioned initially that a challenge comes up anytime there's a change or a need to make adoption of uh, modifications. But this is really seen from our view as an opportunity to improve the system in many ways. But it is going to require a concerted effort, not only amongst the bench, but amongst our staff. And I think our bench and staff is committed to take a serious look at implementing these changes, but also to our stakeholders those that regularly use our system, whether it be uh, public defenders or the prosecutor's office or our clerk's office that we have, or even as the county council, there are recommendations in here that require our uh, involvement, consent, and participation and agreement from the council as well. So we're really looking forward to that opportunity to cooperate with all of those stakeholders, to uh, have participation with that, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we anticipate doing that going forward. But Judge Snyder. Good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right, thank you. I'm Judge Jennifer Snyder, Clark County Superior Court Department 7, and I'm very happy to be here. 
Uh, with regards to slide number four, it's up there now. Uh, the recommendations identified two major areas that they felt uh, the court should be addressing. Number one was to revise our case assignment and calendar, calendaring, excuse me, to improve our case flow. Upon review of our current uh, case assignment procedures, the block schedules that we're currently using, case management data, as well as the perspectives of the judicial officers, staff, stakeholders, uh, as you can see from the report, there were many different people that were interviewed as a part of this uh, consultant and report. The consultants recommended that we end up adopt an entirely new schedule over what we've been doing. And as Judge Vanderwood mentioned in the opening, um, we have changed greatly as a court. I became an attorney in 1996. We had six judges and 1.5 commissioners. We now have 11 judges and 3.4 commissioners. So it's greatly changed over the years. The second major area that was identified uh, and recommendations made has to do with revising the caseload management and organizational issues within our organization. Within the current schedule, uh, efficiency and productivity was identified as a major problem, not only with the court, but also with stakeholders. The recommendations in these areas are designed to address those issues for the benefit not only of the court and justice partners, but perhaps most importantly for the public. Next slide, please. All right, with this slide, you can see uh, on what's my left-hand side, the current assignments and what we're currently doing now with the judicial officers that we have. Currently, we have eight of our judges assigned to criminal and civil departments, three of our judges assigned to family law. Uh, one of those family law judges also oversees adult drug court. And then we have 3.4 uh, court commissioners, mainly handling family law matters, all of our protection orders, juvenile offenders, and dependency cases. Within those assignments, uh, within the criminal and civil division, we have one judge who focuses in on probate and guardianship matters, and another judge who's in a special assignment to handle uh, unlawful detainer matters. So if you look over on the right-hand side, you can see the recommendation that was made. The major change in terms of recommendation was to take the criminal civil department and split it into a specified criminal division, specified civil division, and a family law division. And in the report, uh, identified areas as to why this recommendation would be beneficial would be to allow uh, judicial officers to focus their time and attention to a certain area as instead of being split between, for example, the civil and criminal simplifying tasks for staff, uh, requiring attorneys and the public to interact with fewer departments, and allowing new judges to go into an area other than family law. And so I'd like to go back and just touch on those um, kind of thoughts in terms of beneficial and why that would be beneficial. Uh, currently, both Judge Vanderwood and I are in civil criminal division. We split our time between uh, criminal first appearances, setting bail, uh, having trials on criminal matters, motions, taking pleas, that sort of thing. And then the next day we might do um, civil motions, deal with uh, looking at whether or not someone have a, should have a protection order issued against them, um, deal with an extreme risk protection order that law enforcement might file, something like that. And so we're split in terms of the focus that we're um, in the areas of law that we're addressing. That can be somewhat problematic and be focused in on an area and then have to kind of switch gears and go into a different area. In terms of staff, uh, staff members that are assigned to a judge that's in the civil criminal division, they have to interact with all um, many different prosecutors, defense attorneys, all of the civil litigators, uh, self-represented litigants. And so 
they're as well bouncing around between kind of two areas. Attorneys are required to interact with eight different departments. That can be confusing at times. And we've had, um, as I mentioned, a huge change in our bench in terms of uh, new judicial officers. I came in as a judge in 2019, and uh, since my appointment, we've had four new judges after that. And um, almost every occasion, we have to assign those uh, new judges to family law because of conflicts that they have. For example, if they come out of the prosecutor's office, they could not go into criminal rotation because they would have too many conflicts. And um, in the report, it identifies, and I agree, that um, family law can be one of the more difficult areas for a new judge. Uh, it has a huge learning curve if it's not a practice area that you've been involved in as an attorney. So we have decided as a bench to adopt the recommendation in terms of this particular slide. Um, we've decided to divide our civil and criminal division, have five judges assigned to criminal, three to civil, and keep the three in family and the commissioners and their duties that they have. The assignments uh, were done by agreement and volunteers. There wasn't any disagreement really about that. And so currently we'll have uh, myself, Judge Lewis, Judge Clark, Judge Gregerson, um, and Judge Fairgrave in criminal, Judge Vanderwood, Judge Sheldrick, and Judge Retzinas in civil, and our family law judges will remain uh, Judge Gonzalez, Judge Banfield, and Judge Cornell. Next slide, please. All right. So. The adoption of the case flow principles that's outlined in the report really has to do with best practices and the report goes into, and I won't repeat here, um, the reasons for and the studies that have been done in terms of best practices. One of the things that came up uh, very early on in the report and is discussed in detail is the idea of the doctrine of judicial responsibility. And what that is is a duty of a judge to control the process and monitor the pace of litigation until a case is resolved. And I can say having been a part of the legal community here for 26 years, that that is something that's very different than what attorneys um, want and what has been the historical practices of our county. In other words, um, it's a very common belief uh, within our legal community that attorneys will control the pace of the cases um, as opposed to the judges. And so this uh, doctrine of judicial responsibility, although it's not something new to the bench, it's definitely something new in terms of um, implementing and keeping that in, at the forefront of what we're doing. With regards to that uh, judicial control, the recommendations focused on the establishment of a continuance policy in early case management conferences. Uh, we as a bench, we have already decided that a published continuance policy in criminal cases needs to be adopted. And the five judges that I mentioned that are in the criminal uh, division are meeting regularly. We have a drafted continuance policy that we completed that will be uh, submitted to the rest of the bench on September 20th at our next judges meeting for their consideration and hopefully for adoption. In the civil arena, uh, we have a local court rule in place. I think it's been since 2016. Yeah. Uh, local Court Rule 40 has been in place for about the last six years, and that really controls the pace of civil cases um, to the point that we've decided as a bench that we do not need a separate and a published continuance policy with regards to the civil cases. And in family law, uh, the group of family law judges and commissioners are addressing the continuances with the second part of the recommendation, which you can see there, which is the establishment of the early case management uh, conferences. So with those early case conferences in both civil and criminal cases, it'll allow the judge to do things that we are not really getting involved in unless um, attorneys are bringing it to our attention in the form of motions. And that has to do with what is the status of the discovery in this case, uh, where are the negotiations in terms of offers, um, 
mediation and civil cases, that sort of thing. Scheduling of motions and making orders uh, that could advance the case to finality in some way, either with an agreement, uh, dismissal, et cetera. So the idea with uh, that established early case management conference is that you'll have uh, productive pretrial processes. Those productive pretrial processes will lead to reduced continuances in cases and reduced continuances obviously equal trial date certainty, which you can see there is another uh, identified issue in our county. Frequent opportunities for disposition in criminal cases. The report went into a great deal about basically being able to, and didn't use these words, but strike when the iron is hot. In other words, when a criminal defendant is ready to enter a plea of guilty, that the court's available uh, to take those pleas. And I wanted to just point out, I mean, currently we have um, the ability just on dockets that we have, we have four change of plea dockets every week that we do. Uh, we have a kind of a cap of 13 defendants um, that could, you know, be up to 25 total cases, depending on how many maybe individual cases that those defendants have. That's what we're currently doing. Um, it's somewhat rare that we would have all of those spots utilized each week. Um, we definitely have, had, have seen an improvement or an increased use in the amount of uh, change of plea slots that are being used. Within the new schedule, the criminal division intends to offer plea spots five days a week um, as opposed to the four, in addition to opening up the opportunity to enter a plea of guilty at other um, types of hearings. So, for example, with the pandemic um, and how we had to adapt with Zoom and that sort of thing and people not being in present, because on our felony um, change of pleas, we have to have, if someone's out of custody, they have to be present in the courtroom in order to enter a plea of guilty. We need to have them sign and we need to fingerprint them. And so that's a requirement. Uh, the people that are in custody, we can provide those documents to them in the jail for those purposes. But with the pandemic, we decided that it would be extremely burdensome to try to take change of pleas on other types of dockets like arraignments or motions um, and that sort of thing. And so we have not been doing that for a while. Uh, the report recommends and we agree as a criminal division that we should um, re-explore opening that up to take changes of plea pretty much at any time during the uh, process when the defendant is ready to plead guilty. The last thing um, listed there is the establishment of a centralized trial scheduling system. And within the report, you can see that uh, they've identified having someone from administration um, uh, provide services where basically that person, all information about all trials that the court might be doing within you know, any given week um, is provided to that particular individual they then determine um, who is hearing what uh, and it's established that way. Our current system, um, we have been doing kind of a hybrid version of this over the course of the last few months where um, myself or another judge is provided with it, this information and we assign trials to um, individual departments based on their availability, the length of the case, the type of case and that sort of thing. Um, but what this would do would be to take that off of the, the shoulders of one of the judges, put that with a person who has, um, you know, the proper um, computer management to be able to uh, get those cases sent out to judges so that they can be resolved either with the trial or some other resolution. And so that was uh, the last recommendation in terms of adoption of the case flow principles. I'll turn it back over to Judge Vanderwood at this time. All right, so if we look at uh, changing gears a little bit towards recommendations that go beyond simply the court process and the case flow, we can look at the next slide here. It talks about some recommendations that were made for partners or stakeholders, however that might look at. 
Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time going into those this morning, although they are reflected within the report itself in uh, pretty good detail. Uh, the first one you'll notice is actually a recommendation that the county move towards a public defender's office. The report identifies a variety of reasons why that would be beneficial and is needed and necessary. Uh, they also recommend in a way to move these cases forward to earlier disposition on the criminal side that there be a plea cutoff date that's implemented and again that entails an approach and a philosophy from the prosecutor's office. Uh, there's a focus and an effort for a benefit of e-filing and the need to continue to make that available, expand those options for electronic filing for litigation. Uh, a focus on improved data entry, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, data challenges later, but that is a struggle as a court that's been historically present. It's been an area that's been, frankly, um, under finance, there's been insufficient uh, staff that's been allocated to be able to even address or look into some of those issues. It's only within the last couple of years, for example, that Superior Court got approved a DISC-2 position, someone to deal with technology and data information and to keep those processes analyzed and moving forward. That's a project position even now and not funded for a longer term process. So we're making inroads on that and we certainly appreciate the approval of that process a couple of years ago and we've seen great benefits from having that position in place and are hoping that that will continue as a permanent position. But that position is helpful for us as we interface with the clerk's office, the office that controls primarily the information from our filings and our court system. And then finally, a recommendation for adoption of the Odyssey document management system. And again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that this morning, but the document management system is one that uh, enables the clerk's office to control the documents that we use as Superior Court uh, and the consultants taking a look at available options and um, systems that should or could be utilized, they came to the conclusion that that's a system uh, that is available and should be implemented here. Taking a look at the next slide then on additional recommendations, this is just a variety of other things and I'm not going to identify each of these perhaps Maybe I will. Starting with the first one, to create consistent procedures, Judge Snyder mentioned that right now we have eight criminal and civil judges, uh, and that means that a practitioner or a self-represented litigant might need to reach out to multiple different departments at various different times, depending on the cases. And each of our departments, the 11 judges, are elected, uh, they have control over their department and how it's utilized and how it's functioned. Now, what we do is we try to coordinate and work effectively together to have consistent processes and procedures, but these consultants identified that unfortunately we fall short in those areas and that often we don't have consistent policies between the 11 different judicial departments. So this is one where they're uh, highlighting a need for improvement on our end to be able to have that consistency. Again, benefit not only timeliness of resolution that way, but also make it more user friendly for litigants. The uh, data integrity, uh, that's something, again, going back to the conversation I mentioned just a few minutes ago about the importance of data, the need to be using it, but making sure that it's accurate in our systems. And that's a process that we've implemented and they're encouraging us to move forward. Improvement on technology. Often uh, technology is something that is going to be beneficial to our system, but often challenging to implement. 
one of the benefits, if you will, from the COVID pandemic was it forced us to move into technology areas sooner than we probably otherwise would have. And we're seeing benefits of that. For example, we're utilizing virtual proceedings in many different ways. Even the appearances from defendants that are being held in jail are being done through a video process rather than having them brought over to Superior Court. But the other dockets and hearings that we have, many of those allow participants to not come to court, but to participate remotely and virtually. That's a benefit of the Zoom process. Another area that they highlight is the need to move towards electronic signatures and a way to improve our efficiency because of that. That's technology, frankly, we're currently limited on, and we're looking for ways to adapt that and include that into our system. It would help in a lot of ways if the judicial officer were able to sign electronically orders while the docket, the hearings are actually happening, improve efficiency and case flow, but we're struggling struggling as we look to the best way to do that and get it implemented. The governance structure is one that we actually have the consultants working with us on a separate grant currently, so we're looking forward to see what recommendations they make to help us move forward there. And then I'll spend a little bit of time on the organizational needs. The, the organizational needs of Superior Court, I think, is an interesting one. It's one that historically has developed somewhat over time. But given the increased case numbers, the types of cases that Superior Court has, the demand with various different evolving mandates, the structure and administration and staffing levels of Superior Court is really highlighted in the report, and we agree with a significant challenge and an area for some improvement and progress. I'm going to mention briefly some of those evolving mandates that take place. For example, just in the unlawful detainer area or the eviction area, that's an area Superior Court deals with, and the legislature made significant changes over the last several years about how those are handled, a right to counsel, for example, the process to get to the eviction to take place. When the legislature makes that type of change, it creates additional burden and demand on Superior Court and increases the need for administration and staffing to deal with that. Another example is a move recently from the legislature towards an emergency minor guardianship process. So when there's a minor child that's in dire need of some help, there's a process that allows those to happen immediately and move forward. But a brand new structure was created to uh, deal with that. Again, that flows down to our administration and staffing and creates challenges. So we do have a variety of temporary project positions that have been created over the last few years, and I acknowledge and appreciate the council's help and assistance with that. Uh, we have those with an administrative judicial assistant, a management analysis of the DISC-2 position. We're hopeful that, that will become, those will become permanent positions because they are critical and needed for us in many different ways. This report also highlights the need, however, to move towards an additional management structure. Right now, the only management employee we have is our court administrator, Cheryl Stone, and this report identifies that that particular structure limits the court's ability to look at broad policy issues in a way that helps the court move forward. Often our administrator is left trying to put out fires and immediate issues and problems that develop rather than having a management structure that allows a more comprehensive beneficial look at our process. And it also limits the ability uh, to have someone step in on a management level as may be needed in a variety of different ways. So they suggest a way that some of the current positions in Superior Court may be able to be repurposed in a way that would allow that management structure to be a little bit stronger.
Now, I know you've exhibited a lot of patience with us today as we move through these issues with Superior Court, so I'll try to move through the last portions of our presentation here fairly um, efficiently. But let's look at the next slide, because my guess is one item of concern to all of us is this issue of the effect of the COVID pandemic, specifically a COVID backlog, if you will, and how that may have impacted the court system itself. Now, this slide is one effort to deal with that and put numbers as it relates to the backlog. I will note again that we do have some historic challenges when it comes to data, so I would not guarantee that every single number is completely and exactly accurate, but I think this slide is very important conceptually to point out where we are both before the pandemic as well as afterwards. So if you look at the backlog numbers for both of these slides, the numbers that are reflected there break down into the different types of cases that we deal with. And the number that's identified in each of those categories comes from taking a look at cases that are older than the ideal case disposition time frames. What I mean by that is the administrative office of the court that again oversees the judicial process in Washington has gone through the various types of cases and identified when the various types of cases ideally should resolve. So for example, in criminal cases, the standard would be within the first six months that 98% of those criminal cases get resolved. Within the first nine months, the standard would be to have 100% of the criminal cases resolved within nine months. Certainly not only a need for speedy trials, but just the notion that these cases are timely and need to get taken care of. Now, in reality, there's cases that are very complex. There are cases that are challenging. So to anticipate that every single criminal case is going to be resolved within nine months is uh, unrealistic, shall we say. But the general broad standards are important and they provide a guideline how most cases should move through the system and get resolved. The other cases have also set timelines. They're a little bit longer and I won't go through each of those. But the backlog number here is a total number of these types of cases that at the time were in disposition beyond those standard disposition dates, the ideal dates that were in place. So just taking a look at the first line in February of 2020, the Superior Court criminal cases at that time, there were 792 cases that were outstanding longer than the ideal disposition times. If we look then in the summer of this year of June 22, that number had increased to that 1,117. So a rough look at the backlog numbers under that approach would mean that criminal case backlog increased by 325 during the last two years since COVID was in place. And you could go through each of those and identify the same increase as it relates to COVID. So what that means is the system has a lot of work to do to work through those cases that are outstanding, that the work to do is even more prevalent now than it was prior to COVID in February of 2020. But what the consultants are telling us as well is that even those were our numbers in February 2020, those were far from ideal numbers as well. So our system was not working as efficiently as it should have been even in February 2020, and now the pandemic has only increased that. So we're looking forward to making those changes that they recommend. Briefly, I want to mention here on backlog because there's often discussions about inability of the courts during COVID to move cases through the system, resulting in the increase and the backlog that's in place. As I mentioned in the beginning of my comments, other than a very short time period when we were not allowed to come to the courthouse, 
the courts have been open and available to do the work that needs to be done. It's mandatory, it's required. These are significant events that need to be dealt with. And our staff and our bench has been in court through that process to get it taken care of. The area that has been most impacted during COVID were the periods of time when we were not doing jury trials. And for Superior Court, during the last couple of years, there have been three different periods where jury trials were suspended and not able to happen. Those suspension periods were due to either state and federal mandates that prevented those from happening and or decisions in the local bench in consultation with our local health officer, Dr. Melnick. And I'd like to identify appreciation for him and his responsiveness as we've reached out at various times to get input on what recommendations make sense for us here locally. But based on those areas, there were three time periods where we were not having jury trials. That was February 29th, 2020, at the beginning of the pandemic into July 6th of 2020. That about uh, four and a half month period of time. Then beginning in July of 2020, we began utilizing the Clark County Fairgrounds as a way to space out, to allow us to do jury selection, to allow us to continue to move trials. Uh, we were limited in how many we could do, but we could do one or two of those a week. And when they were available, we did those trials during that time period. Then there was a second period where jury trials were suspended. That was from November 25th, 2020 through March 14th of 2021. And then beginning in March of 2021, we again began during, doing jury trials, initially with the assistance of that spreading out at the fairgrounds. That facility was used, I believe, till the end of May of 2021. And since that time, we've been using the main courthouse to deal with all of our trials since then. So we were open and available for jury trials from that March 2020 up until January 6th of 2022. That's when due to the Omicron variant and the spike in numbers, there was the third and hopefully final suspension of jury trials. That was June 6th of 2022 through February 28th of 2022. Since February 2028, we've been moving forward with jury trials. We've increased the numbers so that we can do uh, four jury trials a week, sometimes more if needed, as we juggle how long those trials are and what takes place. So during the last 24 months then, there's been 10 total months when we were not able to have jury trials, but we were able to do everything else, change of plea, uh, first appearances, civil cases could move forward with all of their hearings, family law cases continued to move forward from the very beginning of the pandemic, family law cases continued to move to trial because juries weren't required, so those were done virtually by Zoom and there wasn't a fall off on numbers with those trials. So we've really tried to adapt, implement change and move forward those cases. I will note that our jury trial capacity has been underutilized for jury trials. So during those periods where we have offered jury trials, we have not been fully busy and they have not been fully utilized for us. For example, if we take a look at this period just in 2022, from the time of January 1st, 2022 to July 31st of 2022, we had 30 total jury trials. 21 of those were criminal trials, nine of those were civil trials. So for that five month period, we ended up having a proc, well, six months or six trials per month where our capacity, depending on non-jury trials and other items, but jury trials always take priority, are more in the range of a minimum of 12 and more often 16 at least per month of trials that we can have. So you can see that we're utilizing well under half during this last year of our jury trial capacity. 
Now, the last several weeks, we've actually had our largest increase in jury trials, and so we've definitely been busier over the last few weeks than we had been previously. And we view that as a good thing, because as noted, to deal with these backlog numbers, we need to be getting those cases resolved and taken care of. Getting to trial, getting to change a plea, getting dismissed on the civil cases and resolved as soon as we can. Simply put, going back to doing the number of trials or disposing of the number of cases we were doing before COVID isn't going to be adequate or enough for us to get through the backlog that's in the system. We need a system that's going to be doing more and doing more efficiently and getting cases resolved sooner. And that's why we're encouraged by this report. We're encouraged by the recommendations. We're excited to move those for forward. The next slide just identifies with some backlog recommendations, and I'm not going to spend time on those. It does involve some recommendation for the prosecuting attorney's office, uh, as well as the plea dockets, and Judge Snyder talked about processes in implementing changes to affect that that we're looking at. The next slide goes to the stakeholder involvement generally. I'm just going to mention here, as I mentioned in the beginning, that we are anxious to involve and engage with those people that utilize Superior Court system. We've been engaged in a listening session with the Clark County Bar Association to go over this report with them, to invite members of the bar to engage with us and participate in work groups as we plan the steps moving forward for the Superior Court going forward. We've had meetings with the prosecutor's office to review perspectives on the report. We're looking forward to meeting with our clerk's office soon to have similar types of discussions in that regard. And we're inviting members of our uh, stakeholders, attorneys, to be engaged in these work groups, as I mentioned, going forward. So with that, that takes us to the end of our presentation. We appreciate your attention, your interest in this import report, and certainly invite questions that you might have for us. Well, I'd like to just say thank you very, very much, not just for giving us the report, but for your receptiveness to having this report done and your openness to taking in the recommendations and acting on them as clearly as you, as you are, and and we appreciate that. It, it it's a a, a marvelous uh, uh, thing that has been done. I think uh, with Clark County, but it wouldn't be meaningful without your openness to it. So thank you for that, Judge. Um, I do have a, a couple of questions, and I'm I'm sure that others will as well. Um, do you anticipate that the change in case flow principles is going to impact? The backlog. I'll defer to Judge Snyder on that one initially. <laughs> um, I would say definitely uh, in the in the criminal arena. I would think that it would just because of the opportunities. More touches on the cases um, provide the judges with a better idea of kind of where these cases are. Also, in terms of um, as I mentioned, the striking while the iron is hot in terms of the pleas. Um, so, just to give you an idea, currently in a criminal case, it would not be unusual to have your first appearance, two weeks later to have your arraignment, um, where all of the defendants enter a plea of not guilty. And at that point, we would set a trial date and a readiness date. We might not see or touch that case again until readiness. And so, under the new case flow uh, suggestions, which we're currently working on as a criminal group, we would be touching that case at least two more times prior to any, they don't call it a readiness in the case flow, but a case scheduling conference. And so more opportunities, uh, more opportunities to put the attorney's uh, feet to the fire, to work the cases earlier in the process. And that's one of the major things that's identified in the report as well. So in that arena, I do believe that it would. Um, civil, I would defer to Judge Vanderwood if he has any comments on that. And we do know in the backlog number on civil that there are a lot of cases that need to be dismissed. Um, 
for a variety of reasons. The, the clerk can dismiss cases or ask us to dismiss cases when there's been a year of no activity. And due to the pandemic and other things, they've been unable to process those. They are doing that now, and we're anticipating dismissing. I know I've dismissed a lot of cases in the last couple of months for that reason, and I anticipate that other judges are doing the same thing. And I'll just add briefly to that. I would agree with what Judge Snyder said on those points. Uh, I will follow up and mention too, though, those cases that are in the system already that are part of the backlog are going to be a little bit unique as opposed to how they're impacted by changes that we make because changes in the system now that get implemented January 1st are going to certainly impact those new filings. But with those backlog that we have, we need to identify the best ways to get those moved through the process. And that's where some of the recommendations from the consultants, I think, can be important with that, including how some of our stakeholders choose to deal with some of those backlog cases as well. Uh, and just a final thought on the civil side, just as Judge Snyder mentioned, that's where those numbers of the backlog slide that I mentioned, uh, backlog slide, take a look at them conceptually as opposed to the exact numeric accuracy of those because, yes, thanks for pulling that back up. If we look at February of 2020 in the civil area, for example, it was showing 1,423 cases outstanding. As we look at those cases, a lot of those should not have technically been open existing cases at the time. For example, they might be an eviction case where someone was ordered to be removed from the property, nothing else to be done with that case, but it was not officially closed in the system. So that gives you a sample of why some of the numbers may not be accurate as far as a case at the time that's open and needs to be dealt with. Well, you know, Judge, as, as, a, as an outsider completely to the process, the recommendation for judicial control for case flow just makes so much sense uh, to me. And again, that is as an outsider. But speaking or thinking um, of reactions on the inside, when there is a change in control, uh, there is a taking and there is a giving up. Um, how do you anticipate um, that change um, to be accepted and to roll out successfully? Well, we're optimistic that the changes that are being recommended will be welcomed from all of the stakeholders and participants. I think anyone that's involved in our system while there may be some portions of the report that there could be disagreements about or different views about, I'm, I am confident that every participant in our system realizes that there are needs for improvement and there are positive changes that can be made. There may be some disagreements as far as how those changes are implemented, and we welcome that dialogue. That's why we're reaching out and meeting with uh, groups as we can. That's why we're anticipating to bring stakeholders into this process, because we do want to hear that input, and we do want to engage with them in a way that's going to be productive and helpful. But you're absolutely right. As I mentioned, change is uncomfortable. It's challenging. It is for us as a spirit court, and I'm sure it will be for other people that utilize the system. But everyone that's involved in the system, I'm confident, wants a system that works effectively, efficiently, and gets cases appropriately resolved as they should be. And so we really think having that in mind is going to get us to the end result that's going to be uh, beneficial in a way that will help everyone. Other questions and comments from council? Chair? Yes, Councilor Rylander. Thank you for the presentation. Um, it's good to see you again. You as well. Uh, I, do you have or will you be preparing sort of an outline or a list of things you would like or need from county council in order to achieve your objectives? And it clear to me that you need, you got your piece, 
there's some funding pieces, you've got the prosecuting attorney office that probably has to contribute in some fashions as well. But from a council standpoint, I'm not asking you for that type of outline or, or list or whatever today, but I guess, is it fair to assume that you'll be coming back and saying, in order to do these things, we need this from you? And it's probably money, but maybe some other things. <laughs> We would be glad to do that, and we would be interested in doing anything that's going to be most helpful for the council. So if it would be helpful for you to have an initial outline at this point from us along the lines that you've mentioned, we'd be more than happy to put that together. If you would prefer that it be handled in a different way, we'd be more than happy to do that as well. So I guess I would uh, defer to you and Ms. Otto as what would be uh, beneficial there. I'll defer to Ms. Otto and to the chair. Um, with the requests that you have um, that need budgetary needs, have there been budget requests submitted for the 2023 budget? Um, Cheryl is going to be the one who's best going to be able to answer that, but I believe the short answer is yes in one form or another. Okay. So um, just for your information, Council Rylander, so we do have a very interactive budget process in which we start with I meet with all of the departments and elected offices to talk about their requests and then we'll have a work session that also they'll be invited to as well to per participate with the council on those specific requests. Um, and then there's actually a separate um, time for feedback with just elected departments with the council. So there is um, pro pieces in the process or parts of the process that will get information in front of council and allow that interactive dialogue. Of course, the council can always request to have a special work session or additional conversations with any of the elected departments. Thank you. I, and so I, I get the money side, or at least I, I will get it, <laughs> I hope. But beyond that, I guess the bigger question is, are there uh, sort of non-monetary things that you're going to need or guidance, feedback, direction? I have, you know, I'm obviously not an attorney at all. So, but from a businessman standpoint, I'd like to know what our goals and objectives are and what the plan is to get there and how we can help. I appreciate even the question because, uh, again, it gets to us a notion of working cooperatively towards that and even the in question from you invites that dialogue and interaction, which we very much appreciate. Primarily, it does come from the council on the budgetary side because that's where the staffing and the structure really gets impacted. Uh, the other areas within the report aren't so much the need of council involvement in decision making as much as we want to make you aware of what's going on and understand the process and its impact. But for me, understanding too the, the, the impact and the, re the responsibilities of the clerk's office, the PAs, I mean, all separate elected officials, I get all of that, but so critical to understand who has to contribute. And, I love trying to distill things down to their essence, just get to the bottom line and and make this palatable and easy to understand. So just for me personally, I would look forward uh, to understanding how each of those contributes and where where we can assist or help coordinate it all. One thing I would say is just referring back to the slide that talked about the partners um, or recommendations regarding the partners because those are things that we as Superior Court, we don't have any control over. Um, the clerk's office, for example, the document management system, um, the data entry in terms of the mandatory e-filing, that sort of thing. I mean, we could adopt a rule that requires e-filing potentially. Um, the prosecutor's office, in terms of the plea cutoff, that would be something with inside their office. And obviously, the establishment of a public defender's office and elimination of indigent defense, that's something for council discussion and probably has been in the past and I anticipate would be again in the future. And I can assure you that we are looking at um, some systems that council can consider that will help impact those areas that um, have countywide, oh sorry, countywide impacts such as IT systems and stuff. So hopefully something will be coming before council within the next month or two that will help with those processes. Other comments and questions from council? No, Chair. Yes, Councilor Olson. Thank you, um, and thank you both. 
judges this morning for your presentation. I appreciate it very much. Um, it's very enlightening. Um, I do also sort of have some questions with regard to a little bit of Councillor Rylander's questions. So it sounds like you're going to implement um, some of the recommendations January. Um, and I assume that's the judicial review process. Uh, I guess my question would be, um, what do you have a process outlined in terms of um, engaging stakeholders? Meeting with the prosecuting attorney's office, meeting with the clerk's office, coming to some agreement on uh, on how you're going to work together to continue to implement the recommendations, and and do you have a timeline? And then when you look at this uh, number of backlog cases, both from 2020 and 2022, do you have a goal in terms of reducing that backlog as a result of implementing some of these recommendations? Maybe Judge Snyder, do you want to address the first question? I'll address the second. The the plan in place currently is the divisions of the judges and commissioners are currently meeting sometimes weekly uh, in order to put forth framework. So for example, like using the continuance policy as an example, we felt that was the number one thing that we should work on as a criminal group. We prioritize that. We have that now available for the bench review. And once that happens, then we would be engaging our stakeholders for feedback with regards to that and potentially changes to that. Um, that would be the prosecutor's office, indigent defense, um, the clerk's office, all those people that are impacted potentially by that. And that's kind of, I don't know, I want to say a timeline. As soon as we can get it approved in its form by the bench, we would be moving that forward to involve stakeholders. Because we obviously have a looming, you know, goal out there of January. How realistic is that if we don't push? So, hopefully that answers your question, Councilor. And then to follow up on your question regarding the backlog, as noted in the report, the first recommendation made by the consultants was to identify what that backlog is. And given the challenges with data and information, that's been our initial focus is just to be able to quantify and identify that. We feel comfortable that we've at least created a structure that gives us an idea on that backlog numerically, which is helpful going forward. And then we also applied and received a grant through that administrative office of the courts to deal with the backlog in a way that would be helpful. That grant's going to allow us to bring in some additional temporary staffing to start working on strategies and efforts with that backlog. So the short answer to your question is, do we have a specific goal at this point? I would say no, but that's a very good question and we're working on putting that goal together right now. And we are working on creating the structure that will allow us to make inroads with that. Madam Chair, follow-up question. Thank you so much. Um, and then I guess sort of in that same um, vein, the number of trials that you currently are holding versus the capacity of trials, it would seem to me if you had your best case scenario, um, I guess my question would be, what is your best case scenario if you have the amount of trials that you think you can uh, manage to help get those cases through the backlog? And then um, my only other comment is similar to Councillor Rylander all these years in the business world, we can't manage what we can't measure. So if we start putting out real measurements out there, then we can manage to those. Um, but just appreciate all that you're doing. And I'm curious about the, the uh, jury trials and what might be the perfect scenario or the best case scenario there. I can answer since I've been doing the central trial scheduling for the last few months. I mean, my goal would be that every judge that's available to do a trial is doing a trial every week that they're available. That's, that should be our goal. Um, I don't think there's anybody on the bench that disagrees with that. And not only that, but I would say that the capacity for the change of plea is fully utilized as well. We're not fully utilizing the change of plea capacity either. So it's really multifold there because even using our maximum trial capacity is not going to solve, if you will, the backlog issue. It includes trials, absolutely, but it also includes getting trials to disposition other than through trial as well. Thank you. 
just to clarify, um, and I believe the answer is that your office per se put together the two lists on backlog. Is is that correct? That's correct. The slide on backlog was put together uh, with help uh, primarily through Cheryl, our court administrator, and Joe Johnson, our DISC uh, assistant, correct? So uh, Cheryl and others will be keeping that up to date monthly or daily or whatever uh, form they, 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 can, they can, is that correct? We're going to continue to track those numbers, and I will let you know, again, one of the benefits of having a DISC person for us is only within the last months, I guess last 12 months, we've had a capacity through that staff to even start tracking what's happening with cases. Before then, we didn't even have staffing capacity to even track numbers at all, which is troubling when you think about it. Uh, but at least we do have that, and yes, we're anxious to be continuing that. Good for you. And then the, to kind of follow up with what uh, Councillor Olson was mentioning on the trial capacity, um, you indicated that you would have a full caseload there if you had your, your uh, druthers in working that through. Uh, for the, the rest of us, if that could become a, a numeric, that would be helpful for understanding um, what the capacity is and what is being achieved. So under the current schedule uh, in the civil and criminal division where you have eight judges, uh, you would have three of those ju judges that are unavailable to do trials because they have to do other duties assigned to them like first appearance of change of pleas, criminal, uh, civil motion dockets and that sort of thing. So in an ideal week, there would be five judges in civil and criminal available to do trials. Now, realistically, you may have somebody on vacation or you may have someone at training, that sort of thing. Um, but that would be the ideal. Under the new system, it would be similar because you would have um, at least two criminal judges per week and two civil judges per week that would be in uh, trial mode. And then other people potentially available to pull, um, for example, family law judges, if their family law cases were to get settled at the last minute, they'd be available to do uh, a jury trial, for example. Thank you. And just a quick follow-up, or even if we have more criminal trials than we have capacity, even if a family law judge has a trial, that family law judge would get their trial rescheduled so that they could step in and deal with a uh, criminal trial that was ready to proceed. So uh, one more question. From a physical capacity versus a personnel capacity, because I'm sitting here listening and I'm thinking, well, you know, in your court space, how many, well, there must be sort of some average number of days that a trial ends up taking. And when you look at your physical space, there's that difference between that and personnel. So is, is there plenty of physical space in general, but you're still going to run short in trying to clear this backlog such that you would need some, some temporary judges in order to utilize the space best? Or maybe that's too much in the weeds. I'm it's not really about the space. Um, it definitely was about the space when we had to socially distance everybody. Um, because we had to burn at least two and sometimes three courtrooms to do one trial um, with social distancing requirements. And we did do that. Um, it's more about the fact that the other duties that the court has to perform must be done every day that we're open. We have to see uh, you know, our felony first appearances. We have to see juvenile offenders that come in within a certain amount of time. Those duties cannot be eliminated to have judges do jury trials. So it, we have plenty of space. Um, it's complicated when we, like yesterday we called in 200 jurors. Um, we have to manage those people, you know, effectively and, and safely, even without uh, social distancing requirements. And so we have space. It's just, we don't have enough bodies and it, there's not a temporary judge solution to the jury trial problem. 
Although you're potentially correct, for example, we just don't have enough courtrooms to do eight trials at one time, for example. So there is some space limit, but it's never been a issue that we've had to face. There have never been enough trials ready to go out on a jury week that uh, would max out our physical capacity. And I did just want to add to, you talked about in the report about the public defender's office. Um, so I just want to let, I know council's been told this a couple of times, but Lindsay and Amber have been doing a lot of research on the public defender's office and working with the state and other counties, see what works, analyzing the data to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples because the model's a little different and a recommendation should be coming within a month. Um, and my anticipation, and I'm looking at Amber, she can correct me, is that we will actually talk to you all first before it is presented to the council for their consideration to make sure that we haven't missed something in that legal process as well. Well, this has been a very informative work session. We have kept you for over an hour. So let me ask uh, council one last time if there are any Further questions or comments? And hearing none, I just think we all join together in giving you judges, Cheryl, everyone on the team, a huge thank you for the work that you're doing. It's important and it's appreciated. Well, thank you. We appreciate that. And before we uh, depart for you to get other work done, uh, we failed to mention, and I should have, how much we appreciate working with both Ms. Otto and Ms. Emery. They are fantastic in uh, reaching out, coordinating, uh, being transparent and inclusive in our efforts. So we appreciate that and look forward to that going forward because we understand that's going to be a critical piece as we move forward in this process as well. So we're glad to have them on board. That's great to hear. Thanks Thank again, so much. and we will see you later. Uh, so, uh, Council, let me ask you, it is 10-11. Do you feel